Oh, with Hannah. Movement. Well, hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to Tending the Actively Dying bedside at the 11th hour. I'm Nina Gurton, and I am a, an end of life doula volunteer for Shalom Johnson Hospice and have been on board. Uh, this is my starting my third year or in the middle of my third year. Um, and I want to, number one, thank uh, Shalom Johnson for asking for and supporting this training and for making it a public offering. Um, Rhonda asked me to um, say what got me into end of life doula work. And um, what I will tell you is it's following nudges. I, I believe very strongly in that. And um, when we have a nudge um, to check it out and see what that's all about. And um, I uh, was a full-time artist and um, received a nudge to check out hospice and did that and uh, started as a friendly volunteer, which I was not good at. And um, that became very clear to me within about six months. And so I talked to the volunteer coordinator and she said, I think you might want to try vigil work. And so that is how I um, started. And my very first vigil was um, just a very interesting experience with um, a man and his brother. And um, the man who was, who was dying was unconscious at the time. Um, and when I walked into that room, I knew that I was there for the brother and not really for, um, for the dying person. And so I held space with the brother for about four hours and he talked the whole time. And then all of a sudden he stopped and I realized my work was done. So um, that got me to um, end of life doula training and um, and then helping Shalom to start their program with end of life doulas. And we now have about 15 of those and are very excited about the vibrancy and um, just the way that the program is going. So um, thank you all for coming. So dying is a threshold moment that is a lot like birth, um, right? There's a life force that's shifting, but instead of laboring into the world, um, that life force is leaving. And my goals for today are to explain what 11th hour is, how it works, an 11th hour, and to offer some tips on prep and approach, guiding, healing, and best practices. So for some of you that are, um, that are already doing or have done um, 11th hour, this will be a refresher. And for others, this may be new information, and it is a lot of information and certainly not comprehensive. Um, I go into a few things in detail, but there is so much more um, to 11th hour and end of life. Um, if you have questions, we will take them at the end. You can feel free to put them in the chat or um, just raise your hand when we open it up um, at the end of the presentation for, um, for questions. There are a couple of uh, slides that have Shalom specific information. If you are volunteering for a different hospice, please feel free to um, just tuck that away in your mind and adjust to the hospice that, um, that you are or the agency that, that you're working for or volunteering for. So what I invite you to do is to settle into your chair and um, if you're comfortable closing your eyes to do so, if you're not, um, just soften your gaze, maybe look down. And I would invite you to listen, um, listen deeply to this quote from the book, The Prophet. If you would indeed behold the spirit of death, open your heart wide unto the body of life. For life and death are one, even as the river and the sea are one. Only when you drink from the river of silence shall you indeed sing. And when you have reached the mountaintop, then you shall begin to climb. And when the earth shall claim your limbs, then shall you truly dance. 
So feel free to open your eyes and return to the room. What I wanna say about this is that we hold life and death in, in, our, in both hands. They are with us from the moment of birth and we just don't necessarily acknowledge that. Uh, we exercise the life muscle all the time. It's the death muscle that we don't exercise until, um, until we're faced with it, either that of our loved ones or those that we serve or our own. And the more we lean into that discomfort of holding life and death in balance, the more intentionally we will live. And accepting that we will die allows us to live more fully. So what is 11th hour? Well, at its most basic, 11th hour is a period of time. It's an opportunity to be intentional, to bring our gifts to those who are preparing to leave the earth, and to give comfort to them and their people. It's also a threshold moment, one that doesn't get a do-over. As such, it's also a sacred time, and we are invited to approach this threshold with wonder and with awe and with curiosity. It's also known as the actively dying phase of dying. Often the body begins preparing for its 11th hour months in advance. For those of us tending the dying, 11th hour vigiling is often defined as the last 24 to 48 hours of the active dying phase. 11th hour is also a period of service. So with that, um, the 11th hour volunteers have uh, been trained by Shalom um, and by other hospices, if you're with a different hospice and do 11th hour. And we come to the bedside to honor that person who is dying. And we come to the bedside to do our best to bring comfort and calm. And it's a time when the presence of 11th hour volunteers are both, it's, it's helpful and it's critically important to the patient, to the caregivers, and also to the staff. And 11th hour volunteers have been uh, specially trained through the hospice and they volunteer alongside hospice staff, other end of life doulas, caregivers, and they are intentional in their service. Their presence can lessen anxiety, it can bring calm, and both not just to the patient, but also to the caregivers. Most importantly, 11th hour volunteers can offer a much needed break to caregivers, which allows them to tend to their own needs, even if that's just for a short while. End of life doula volunteers have been specially trained outside of hospice to offer practical, spiritual, and emotional assistance at the end of life. Their work is patient centric, which means that the patient's needs are what we focus on. That's the top priority. From there, we focus on meeting the patient where they're at, and we assist the patient's family and caregivers and close friends as needed. Doulas have been trained to listen deeply, to hold space, and part of their work is to help lessen anxiety and fear around death by educating on the physical signs of death and dying and how to care for the actively dying during the 11th hour. So doulas have been trained to bring calm, to invite a leaning into death for patients. It can be uh, inviting them to relax into the process through guided meditation or through coaching. For the caregivers, it can be helping them to focus on what's in front of them and to show them how to bring comfort. At Shalom Hospice, doulas work as a team and side by side with 11th hour volunteers, hospice staff, and caregivers. Dr. Barry Baines, who was the former medical director of Shalom Hospice, developed the original Two Roads to Death slide, which I've slightly modified here to make it in um, the present tense as we see to general pathways to death, um, primarily because people can die suddenly and people can die accidentally. Um, however, when people are in hospice, there are usually two pathways to death. One is what we call the usual path, which um, most of the uh, people in hospice will, will go through that process. Difficult path can be um, very hard for 
families, it's hard on the, on the patients, um, but you can see that um, both paths lead to the state of semi-comatose and then comatose and then dead. One is just a little bit more peaceful. The other one uh, needs a little bit more tending. Um, not everybody goes through all the steps of each progression and it's, it is a commonly held belief that um, people that are semi-comatose or comatose can hear. And so we always encourage uh, people at the bedside to make sure that they are um, talking to their patient or their loved one and um, letting them know what they're doing and that they love them and telling stories. So volunteers that are doing 11th hour are invited to put together a toolbox, which is simply a bag that they're gonna grab and go out the door with. And um, there's some very um, common sense things to have and then there's things that are specific for the patient. So vigiling work is, um, is work where we're there sometimes for, for a lot of hours. And so it's really important to have our needs met too. So it's not just about, um, it's primarily about the patient, but we, in order to serve the patient, need to have our needs met too. So um, I always carry a wrap for warmth because um, I get cold a lot. Um, my reading glasses are a must do. Um, and then I usually bring tea um, and a little something to eat. And then cords for electronics uh, because I do uh, carry like a small boom box and um, my smartphone. So I plug those in as well. Um, for the doulas, um, uh, I would invite, well, for everybody, I would invite them to have books, uh, poetry and prose, um, something that, um, that is gentle and maybe about nature or um, very present minded. Um, a music source, which would be a, a smartphone um, or a small boom box if, um, if you have it. Unscented lotion. Um, and if you bring lotion, make sure that it's hypoallergenic or very softly scented. And then I would go further. I would also invite um, doulas especially to have an electro electronic thermometer and oximeter and a stethoscope. Um, those are to help gauge the decline of the patient as we're going through the 11th hour process. So um, if, if doulas are doing um, body washing or they're doing aromatherapy or they're doing any kind of ritual, I always invite them also to have, make sure that they have the essential oils they need, any herbs that they may need, and then a small body wash in case they can't find one um, at the bedside. So you've got your toolbox and you've got the 11th hour call. What are the, what is it that you're gonna do? So here's the basics. You're gonna follow all the organizational and facility protocols. You're always gonna introduce yourself and you're gonna ask questions such as, um, what's going on with the patient? Who might be in the room with the patient? And then when you get into the room with the patient, you're always gonna ask permission from that patient to do whatever um, it is that you, are, you start to do. Um, once you've, you've asked permission and you start taking a look at um, the body and the nail beds and the, and the face, you make an assessment. And based on that assessment, you take action. So um, always be ready to um, maybe if, if a patient is uncomfortable or needs to be repositioned, um, take action. Go to, the, go to the desk and ask for someone to uh, come and reposition the patient. If they're uncomfortable, find out if it's time for a PRN med. Um, if everything's fine and you're in with that patient, ask permission to sit down, to listen deeply, just listen deeply. And that, that might be to the caregivers and the family that are in the room. It might be the patient. Sometimes they're still with us in the 11th hour and can talk and can share. Um, always offer loving kindness and empathy and be aware of all the needs in the room, which means their needs and your needs. So 
you've arrived at the Homer facility and you take a moment to compose and prepare. You ground yourself. You feel the support of the car seat. You feel the support of the floor underneath your feet. You acknowledge that you have all the tools that you're going to need to be of service. You take a deep breath and you make your way in. You follow all the protocol, you check in if, you're, if it's needed, find out who's with the patient, get an update on what's happening, and then you head to the room. And just before you cross the threshold, you stop. You set your intention to bring care, to bring compassion, to bring empathy and loving kindness. Take a breath, enter the room, and don't forget to continue to breathe. For 11th hour volunteers, take a look around. What do you see? Who do you see? Introduce yourself as a hospice volunteer, focus on the patient, ask if they need anything. If they're unresponsive, let them know that you'd like to sit down and then spend some time with them. Ask permission to touch, whether it's holding their hand or touching their arm. And if you're going to hold their hand or their arm or their foot, remember to do so from underneath. This minimizes tethering for the patient and tethering is when they feel that they're being held down. Um, when they're in the 11th hour, they're straddling a line between this world and wherever it is that they're going to go to next. So we want to give them freedom to be able to move. So always hold from underneath. If lips and tongue are dry, use a wet mouth sponge. If reflexes are still in play, the patient might bite down on the sponge, so be prepared, be prepared for that. Um, then ask them to release until they finally do. Also use lip balm after moistening to keep lips from cracking or to relieve cracking. And if caregivers and family are present, ask them what they loved most about their person. Ask them to recall a favorite story or a memory and remind them that the patient can still hear them even if they're unresponsive. To hear what's shared is good for the patient, it's good for the caregivers that are attending, it's good for the family, and it's good for the 11th hour volunteer, and it gives them a deeper insight into who that person is who's in front of them. Friend of life doulas, follow the same steps. Look around, introduce yourself, then focus on the patient. Ask permission to look at their feet, legs, arms, hands, Assess where the patient is in the active dying phase. Again, are they grimacing or are they restless? Pain meds might be helpful, so find the nurse. Ask them uh, when the last meds were given, and sometimes it really is through that extra set of eyes that we are and how we come that, um, that invites the patient to get what they need. So don't be afraid to inquire. If you're gonna use the oximeter or take a temperature, let the patient know that you're going to do that. If you're going to listen to their heartbeat, let them know that you're going to do that. And also look at the nail beds and around the mouth to see if there's a shift in coloration. Pay attention to their face and then make note of what you see. This is your baseline. So this will help you to assess the patient and to continue to assess. So you've assessed, you've got your baseline. <coughs> now you can focus on physical needs. So I would invite always for you to trust your instincts. Always trust your instincts. How best can you comfort? Is it by strengthening, straightening a pillow? Is it by asking staff to reposition? Or is it simply by sitting quietly by the bedside, holding hand and space? If the patient is restless and the room needs tidying to bring some peace, do that. Create the sacred space that this threshold moment deserves. Then after tending the patient and if caregivers are present, what do they need? Maybe permission to take a break, maybe an invitation to lean in, an invitation to say goodbye. Test the water by asking questions that will help them to reflect and move into deeper emotional space. There may be some unfinished business that needs tending. Invite them to release their loved one into that bliss that, it, that awaits by giving them permission to die. Also, if there's a full house, which means 
the, the patient, their children, their children's children. Um, if it's chaotic, use your intuition to discern who's in charge in that room. Ask that person to help you get things under control and to help bring peace and calm into the room. This is a sacred moment. Sometimes there's quarreling between siblings. If that's the case, invite the one with the most emotion out of the room. Listen to their story. Do your best to diffuse the anger or assuage some of the grief. Working with dysfunction is a challenge and you may need help. Ask staff to assist if things are out of control. Remind everyone that this is a sacred moment, not a time for arguments and fighting. Work hard to withhold your own judgments. Family history is family history. Our job is to create and hold space, doing our best to ensure our patients a peaceful death. So best practices during 11th hour, um, set personal boundaries. If you find that after 11, every 11th hour you sit in on, you are grieving and in distress, you will need to do some trigger work and some boundary work, both of which are an invitation for personal growth. It's not a failure. The better your boundaries, the better you will be able to serve. Five-hour shifts are protocol. They're recommended as best, best practice. That being said, sometimes we stay longer. Sometimes we don't stay as long. Um, be aware of your own time and energy. We come to the bedside as we're able, and sometimes an hour or two is all we have to give. And if that is what we have to give, we have given what we can. Always introduce yourself, offer a short explanation of who you are, especially to staff. If arriving in the wee hours, someone may not be at the desk, so go directly to the patient room. And when a staff person does come in, introduce yourself then. Use the email thread to update the 11th hour team of your visit and to share important observations or happenings so that the next volunteer is up to date. Trust your intuition and your senses to take care of who and what is in front of you and always take care of yourself. You're a valuable asset to the team, so please treat yourself as such. So dying is a sacred moment, and I, I mean that in, in a human sense. Um, we're born only once, and we die only once in this lifetime, as far as I'm aware. And as such, we honor it and we honor it by doing what we can to create intimacy and the sacred. So the invitation here is to be practical. If the patient is unresponsive, check and see if they have a vigil plan. If they have one, use it. If they don't, use your intuition to do what you can to make the room comfortable. Ensure privacy as best you can. Tidy up. Place family photos and mementos front and center for the patient. No overhead lighting. It's right in their face. And so the best thing that you can do is to um, make sure that you have side lamps. If there aren't any side lamps, um, then turn on a bathroom light or a hall light and then close the, close the door a bit. What you wanna do is off, offer a soft ambiance in the room at night. Adjust the temperature of the room and the window treatments if you need to. If you have access to music, find something soothing or non-tethering. Add it to your playlist library. Read poetry and prose that brings presence. I personally like Wendell Berry, Rilke, Mary Oliver, and John O'Donohue. They're great options to carry with. And also look around the room for love letters, for any cards or notes, and read those, and then fall into trust that the words are being heard. I want to talk briefly about um, lens that we come to the room with and culture, um, diversity, and death. Our invitation is always to meet the patients where they're at. So we want to do our best to have an understanding of who that patient is when we walk in the room. So what is their culture? Are they part of the faith community? Are they gender diverse? Leave your biases at the door and understand that different cultures too have rules around touch, body modesty, and more. And by honoring and respecting those rules, we honor and respect our patients. Asking questions respectfully is good practice. 
and families will appreciate it as well. Death and dying are scary for most people. And when the dying person is someone that they love, their death is going to rock their world. We can help assuage fear though. And we do this by answering questions honestly, by inviting curiosity, by building trust one step at a time. If you don't know the answer to a question, say so. And then see if you can get an answer. If you, lis if you listen, as you listen to patient and caregiver questions, offer what you do know, ask clarifying questions to go deeper, and listen some more, and then repeat. By doing this, you're guiding both the patient and the caregiver. The greatest fear that um, most people have is what's going to happen to their body. They want to know how it's going to change. They want to know what their death might be like. Uh, naming the fear brings it out into the open. And once it's in the open, it can be looked at, talked about, and fear naturally starts to diminish. So we can talk about the physical changes and normalize the process. We can also help folks to understand that not all of, the, all of the changes that we might say could happen will happen for everyone. Surprising for people too is that often the body has been preparing for death for a very long time. Each person's death is unique. So be prepared to be surprised and learn from each patient who is also your teacher. Help patient and caregivers to see death as a normal part of life. Invite them to take out the emotion and to be curious. What might their death look like? I like to teach patients about the elements and how they leave the body. Knowing the signs of each element's departure helps me to assess a patient and helps me to better gauge how close they may be to death. So let's start with Earth. So Earth is the first element that leaves the body and Earth changes start um, they can start anywhere from 12 months out to two weeks before dying. Um, we see the, um, what we note is that there's a weakness in the body. There's a slowing down. Um, motor skills are not quite as good. They're not quite as fine. Um, earth leaving the body presents itself as a lessened interest in people and food and hobbies, especially food. That is the one thing I I really watch for how much are they eating? Are they eating one quarter of what they're served? Are they eating maybe two bites and then push it away? Uh, food is really a, a great way to be able to sort of see where you're at with, with earth leaving. Difficulty in ambulation presents. Um, the patient will have diminished arm and core strength. There's an emotional withdrawal, um, which is really hard on family and caregivers. Um, and sometimes the patients will um, sit and process trauma and life events and their meaning, their legacy with their eyes closed and not a word. And it's just a part of the process. So if that's happening with your person, don't, don't take it personally. It is just a part of the process. We also see increased sleep, increased naps, um, the sense of smell begins to diminish and isn't working quite the way that it used to. Nearer toward um, the end of the earth phase, um, personal scent changes. So breath and skin and sweat, um, they all smell differently. It doesn't, your person doesn't smell quite like your person anymore. Sometimes they feel ungrounded or lost, which um, oftentimes can, um, can create that falling or that, um, you know, they, they fall more or they trip or they have a little bit more trouble um, staying two feet up. The next element to leave the body is water. And that begins three months or less um, from death. And it is the second element to leave. Um, what we note about uh, water leaving is that there's a diminishment in the taste sensation. 
hearing um, shifts and changes, and um, oftentimes the patient has trouble hearing. Um, there's also some cognitive um, dissonance. There's not as, as much understanding. There, you, can, you can give um, uh, suggestions or you can tell them a, a something and they might ask you to repeat it. Um, they, they're having a little bit more trouble Dehydration works. Um, it we often get a, we have a lot less clarity, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. When water leaves, it presents as um, a dry tongue or a rough tongue. Um, chewing and swallowing is very difficult. You'll see that oftentimes uh, people want pureed food instead of their regular food, um, mashed potatoes, um, that type of thing. There's not as much saliva, so that makes the swallowing more difficult. Um, there can be a um, loss of body um, liquid control. So um, eyes just continually water. Um, there can be a runny nose, drooling when they're sleeping. Um, and then way towards the end of the, the water element leaving, um, there can be a change in urine coloration. Incontinence can be a part of um, an early part of uh, someone's journey, but um, it generally will hit in the water phase as well. So you'll see um, you'll see people have to shift into a Foley catheter or um, or depends. Um, and um, again, that change in urine coloration um, it goes from that light uh, pale yellow. Um, and then near death, it is a dark, dark brown. And part of that is the kidneys have shut down. And so um, that, and then the dehydration. Um, there can be a point at which um, the patient can't get enough to drink. So their thirst is very much increased. And then as they get closer to death, they, they push it away. They don't want any, they don't want any more water. Um, people can become emotionally lonely and um, kind of more needy, uh, demanding, um, kind of cranky as well. Um, and part of that is that dehydration aspect. During this time, there is an active uh, processing of any unfinished business or soul wounds or childhood trauma. Um, and um, so you, you may, they may wanna talk about it, they may not. Um, but it's usually in the water phase that that occurs. <clears throat> okay, so the next is fire. And um, fire begins usually one or two weeks before death, and it's the third element to leave the body. With fire, if you think about fire, if you just even think about um, what a fire looks like, it, it's fluctuating and it's changing and it's shifting and um, that's what the fire stage is. So there's some disorientation, there can be an increase in agitation, there can be a, um, this loss of focus, this loss of ability to um, kind of keep their head in the game, um, even visiting, um, with people visiting, it, it just becomes labor. Um, for them to try and um, keep sense of and hold a conversation. Fire presents as fluctuation change in temperature. Um, so you, you could see someone have a fever and a little bit later, their temperature is normal. Sometimes temperature goes down, some, it's, it's all over the board. Skin also fluctuates. It goes from clammy to dry, clammy to dry, clammy to dry. and and just the way that it feels. Um, color changes with the skin. Um, you'll have flushing, um, you can have some bluing um, and yellowing. Um, part of the yellowing has to do with um, kidney and uh, liver function. Um, so if you think of fire, fire dries things out. So that's when we get cracked lips, we get a dry mouth, dry nose, um, nasal bleeds. Um, that terminal agitation where they're pilling at the at their blankets or they're um, or they're rocking back and forth or just can't get settled um, that occurs in this fire um, 
during the fire um, shift. Also, they, they can become really emotionally distant, which is also very hard for family and caregivers. Um, things are less important. Things are less important here. And they finally might, it might say, am I dying? Or I think I'm dying. Um, or I am dying. I think I'm dying. Um, and we can, we can say, yes, yes, you are. You're, you're actually dying. You, you only have a little bit of time left. Um, the other thing that is really interesting in this fire, fire um, stage is that vision changes. There is, um, there is more of a thinning of the veil um, and the, the thinner the veil, the more um, people see uh, there's a near-death awareness. And I wanna talk a little bit more about near-death awareness. So it's super common. Uh, people see, I'm sure most of you have heard um, people say uh, that their parent or their loved one saw their, their mother or their father or their children or um, they were in the room or sometimes they don't know who is there, but they, they can see someone in the room. Normalize that experience if it happens because um, it's nothing to be afraid of and it's nothing to, to increase the fear in the patient. Um, thinning of the veil is common and um, very happens, I would say, to most patients. Um, if the patient is talking about something that, um, that I can't understand, and if there are caregivers or family in the room, I might ask them, what do you think they're saying? They're saying this, what do you think it means? Um, sometimes caregivers um, or family will be able to say, oh, that, that could be you know, their dog, Biff, um, that they're talking about or whatever. It's, um, they will have that family history that they can lean on and, and, um, and kind of maybe give some meaning. Uh, pay attention to what they say. Um, I had one patient that, that kept saying, I, I need to go home, I need to go home. And his wife said, you are home, you are home. And I said to her, I think he may be talking about a different home, the next home. And once, once I said that, then she was able to comfort him in a different way. And she was able to say, go ahead and go, 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 go. Um, when patients are in near-death awareness too, sometimes they will, they'll be reaching out like to try and touch whoever's out there. Um, they will fall out of bed. Um, attempting to reach whoever is out there or trying to, to go home. Um, they think that they need to go somewhere. Um, one of the folks from the three o'clock session mentioned that a doula um, had said to her patient, okay, I'm gonna help you and I'm gonna pack your bag. And she packed a bag for this patient. And she said, we're just gonna leave it right here by, by your bed so that when it's time for you to go, we'll be ready. That's all it took all that patient needed. The last element that I want to talk about is air. And air generally leaves um, either you can see it starting to really shift one or two days before dying and all the way through till death. It's the last element that leaves the body. If you think about birth, um, when we're birthed in, uh, baby goes oh, like that. And when we are laboring out of this world, the last thing we hear is <sighs> And that breathing changes. It, it can change, it can be raspy, it can be regular, it can be apneid, it can be um, uh, shallow, um, it can be deep breaths and, um, and then no breaths. Um, eyes change, um, eye reflexes don't work. Um, Oftentimes the eyes stay mid-range open. Um, bluing and modeling starts to occur on the body. And oftentimes um, a patient, if they are, even if they've, they've kind of followed the progression quite a ways, they could have a, a, a surge of energy. And um, one of the people on the three o'clock call talked about um, a patient who asked to they had been actively dying, asked to get out of bed, 
um, they put her in a Broda chair, took her into the dining room, and um, she had she sat with all these friends of hers that she had been with for I don't know how long, but um, it was kind of her last surge. And um, we also see some increased restlessness. So there can be um, that in the bed, moving back and forth, and again, that terminal agitation, um, crying out, um, which can be very hard for, um, for family to, um, to hear. And um, again, the, the breath is different. You can have the rattling, which um, rattling is just a pooling of the um, of fluids right down here in the, in the throat. Um, it's, it doesn't mean necessarily that they're gonna die within a, an hour or anything like that. What it just means is that fluid is pulling down at the bottom of their throat. Um, there is medication that can be given to um, patients to um, dry that up. Um, also, uh, as oxygen is decreasing, so as that air is shifting in the body, and this is when an oximeter is really helpful. Um, so for you doulas that are, um, that are tending, um, you'll be able to see what the oxygen um, rate is for a patient. And it can go from, um, it can be in the 90s, low 90s, down in the 80s. Patients can still turn around and, and maybe bump back up from that um, um, 80, five mark. Um, once you get down past 80 and you, you continue to go down, um, that restlessness can increase. Um, temperature will begin to decline. Usually um, temperature goes down into the 90s and possibly into the 80s and even lower. Um, when the patient has eyes open, oftentimes they're, they're looking, it looks like they're looking at you, but you can tell you're not connecting and it's almost like they're looking through you. It's, um, that can be a little bit unnerving for uh, families and caregivers. And so normalizing that and explaining that that is, that is just something that happens very close to end of life. Um, it's a very glassy eyed um, look. Um, extremities begin to, to become cold, primarily because the, all the blood is moving into that center section of the body. And so the, um, the blood isn't flowing through the way that it, that it was. And so the extremities, the hands and the feet get cold. Um, they will start to model, uh, which is a purpling, uh, almost it looks like a bruising, but it's just a pooling of blood um, on the underside, whatever is touching um, or wherever the gravity is. So um, that's a good indicator that you're getting close. Uh, bluing of the nail beds is something that I look for and, and around the mouth. Um, and then what I, what I always find really interesting is the facial changes that occur. Um, uh, the face, it, there's a shifting and the person that I maybe met two days ago and I come back does not look like the person that's in the bed. Um, the, the, the face grays, it can become very waxy um, and it can sink, it becomes sunken. Um, and it is pretty quick after this that the patient becomes comatose or unresponsive. Oops, back to one. Okay. So we've been through this, this um, kind of roller coaster of the breath and air. And um, some of it's been noisy, some of it's been hard, some of it's you, you wait for that next breath to come and you wait and you wait and then there's a breath and then nothing. And then all of a sudden the breathing has stopped. Um, your patient, your loved one has died. Their heartbeat and their pulse have stopped. Uh, generally, the eyelids and the mouth are open. And uh, there are ways to close the eyelids and there are ways to close the mouth, but just normalize that for the family and um, caregivers that um, generally they do remain open. Um, make the body comfortable. 
this is a time to, um, you can shift the body now. Um, before you didn't want to create any pain for the body. And so now you can, you can move the body around a little bit in the bed. You can, um, you can tuck the pillow up um, into the, underneath the head. Um, and remember that death isn't an emergency. Take a moment and pause. Offer gratitude to this person who was your teacher. So if uh, previously agreed upon, um, oftentimes doulas uh, will help to wash and dress the body. Um, there is a, um, at Shalom, we do have a, a fairly good sized um, Jewish community living in, in the facilities. And if they die, their body is taken um, to the funeral directors and there is a group of, of women who go in and wash the body and prepare the body. Um, if otherwise, if, if they're not Jewish and if um, it's something that um, the family or the, the person has wanted, this would be the time where um, the doulas would come in and start to wash the body and to dress it. Um, and what's beautiful about this process is that you can invite anyone that's in the room to help. And what that does is it, it allows people to begin really leaning into grieving because they realize this, this body is just a shell. It's not the person that was here. And so there's, there's something that connects with that. And so by touching the body and by washing the body and by blessing the body, um, when I do a body washing, I always invite, um, if people are helping me, to um, everyone to bless the body. So as we wash the face, we bless the body, we bless the face, we bless the mouth that kissed us, we bless the mind. And just all the way down, it's just, it's just such a beautiful thing to be able to do. Um, then we dry the body, we dress the body, and then we set the body. And um, we straighten out the bed, we, we make sure that everything is, um, looks just lovely and peaceful. And um, and then we can call the funeral director and wait for them to show up. Um, you can shift the room if you're a ritualist or you like ritual, you can shift the room with ritual. That would be a really great time. Um, otherwise, it's a great time to invite family uh, caregivers to um, offer some memories, offer some stories, ask for forgiveness one last time. Um, also to encourage one-on-one -on -one time with the body. If you have a large family that's there, um, encourage them to step out and just one at a time go in and spend time with their person. And pay attention. Pay attention to what you see, what you hear, what you intuit, maybe what comes up and maybe if someone is, is grieving really hard, maybe you need to go and, and um, be with that person for a moment. Um, also with Shalom, um, their, their policy is that caregivers and family can remain with the body for up to eight hours. So um, if someone uh, dies at home, um, that body can remain at home for 72 hours before it has to be picked up and taken uh, by a funeral director. Whatever you do and however you do it, depart with gratitude. Um, this person has been your teacher and um, there's a lot to be thankful for. So let's see, in closing, um, be aware of how the work affects you. This is hard work. This is not um, for the faint of heart and it is heart work as well. Um, and because it does affect us, it's fabulous to have um, a buddy that we can um, rely on to share a story. They're not gonna try and fix it. They're just gonna hold that space. Um, if again, um, you find that you're triggered more often, um, uh, do some work around that. Uh, I tended initially when I first started doing the work to be triggered by 
women in their 90s who weighed about 90 pounds and they reminded me of my mom and um still can get a little misty talking about it but that was hard for me it was hard for me to go in and to spend that time because I was reliving it so I needed to let that go and um that's part of practicing good self-care um taking care of you uh taking up some bath when you get home uh taking a shower and just letting all the day's stuff just go down the drain. And we're not perfect. We're not gonna ever be perfect at what we do. And so if we've had a misstep, practice self-compassion too. Um, no one expects perfection. Um, we tend to do that. We tend to do a great job of expecting perfection from ourselves. And the reality is, is uh, be compassionate about the work that you do. Um, and clearing your emotional biofield, you can do that, you know, like I said, in the shower, or you can do it with sage, or you can do it with crystals. Um, also helpful is to develop rituals that bring closure and that help you to heal. Um, rituals can bring closure for families, but they can also bring closure um, uh, for you personally. So if, um, if you have someone that you've worked with, and maybe you've worked with them for a long time, um, honor them through a, a short ritual. It doesn't have to be any lengthy thing. It can just be lighting a candle, saying what you're grateful for, and then blowing it out. And again, we practice and we practice and we practice. And that's the work. So with that, um, I believe we open it up for questions. And I'm going to stop sharing so I can see who's in the room. I'm grateful to see some friendly faces. <laughs> so you can take y'all, y'all can take yourselves off of mute. And if you have a question, just go ahead and raise your hand or um, ask. And I see, Wendy, you put something in um, chat. He had a situation where the dying person was clearly seeing people he loved who had died before him, kept pointing them out to the living uh, members. Some were super uncomfortable and one rolled their eyes. Any coaching on how best to handle? Yeah, just normalize it. Take them aside. I mean, if you're getting somebody that really is being cynical about it, um, to say, hey, got a second, let's go out in the hallway and just explain to them that it's super normal and, um, just part of the process. I was going to mute us. Anybody else? You know, when you said um, that you were triggered by um, a, a patient of a certain type because they reminded you of your mother, and you and you dealt with it. Did did how do you mind sharing how you did how you dealt with it? Did you stop caring for people in that situation? No. No, actually I leaned in, but what I did do was I grieved my mom. And I think, you know, sometimes we stuff that stuff. Um, when my dad died, it took me about two years before I cried. And when my mom died, it took me about a year before I cried. And she, she died in 2008. And um, I started this work in 2016. And, um, the intense doula work in 2018. So um, I kept getting these patients that were just like, they looked just like my mom. And so I finally had to just give my grief its due. And I've been pretty, I talk about it and I get a little missy, but I, I can easily work with people that are, remind me of my mom now. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Um, I want to say something. Uh, this is Carrie Siegel talking. Um, I used to work in the ICU, in the medical ICU. So we had a lot of patients that died on, when I was working. Um, and one thing is about the agonal breathing that goes on, even after the patient appears dead. And mm -hmm. it used to kind of freak people out, families, nurses, you know, it just happens. And so maybe you could touch on that a little bit for 
people. Yeah, actually, I'd, I'd appreciate your expounding on it, Carrie, because um, I've only had one patient that it was an expiration that was, and if there are any other doulas that have had that, but to have that, <sighs> yeah, um, yeah, I've only had that once. Oh. So um, if, if you can expound on it a little bit more. I thought all great. patients did that. <laughs> that uh -huh. For my uh -huh. experience, but um, it's just a little, it can, it can scare you because you're, you're not really, you don't know when it's going to happen. So it catches you off guard. They just let out noises and, and, you know, it, it's just, it's just noises basically. But, um, and a lot of times the patient's family, well, sometimes they were in the room, sometimes they weren't in the room, but anyway, I just think it's good to mention it because it does happen, but your experience is you only had it once. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah. And, and I think, you know, when I, when I said prepare to be surprised, yeah, there are lots of surprises. Um, yeah. I had, um, I was working with uh, Nina Arsenault with a patient and thought we went in to see her. We were by the bedside and I thought just by all the signs, oh, I figured maybe five hours to <laughs> a day. And she lasted another seven or eight days. Oh, and yeah, it was yeah. like, oh my goodness, you know, she's bounced right back and um, not bounced right back, but certainly it was a much lengthier um, actively yeah. dying phase than what I had expected. Um, another thing I'd like to mention is about a stroke patient. Mm -hmm. Have you had experience with a stroke patient? So they're not going to be moving usually anything. And um, I just remember an experience that I had with one of my friends that had massive stroke. And I went to visit her and the family, for whatever reason, had stopped coming to visit her. And um, so she couldn't move anything. And I brought some music with me and I just talked nonstop like the whole time, <laughs> telling her what I was doing and what our friends were doing or whatever. And she, her eyes followed me around the room the entire visit. I was there for hours and I would move around the room and she just kept following me. And I was just like, oh my God, she, I was convinced she knew exactly what was going on, but she was like yeah. trapped in this body. It was, yeah. Yeah, and she lingered like that for, it was like two weeks. Wow. It was really incredible. You were doing all that just, doula work right then and there. It was so long ago too. But just, you know, I remember like a patient, if they can't move or whatever, they can still hear you. I don't yeah. know how long patients can hear you. You think till the very end. I don't know if you've read studies about that or whatever, but. Yeah, they, we generally, I, I would say, and doulas shake your heads, yay, nay, but um, we we think pretty close to the end. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nina, I loved what you said about um, the, the use of the ritual after death. You know, in our culture, because generally in our culture, we don't talk about death very much. We don't have... We don't have a, a normalized ritual for it. Families can think that once the death has occurred that they have to hurry up and call the cremation society or the, the, the nursing home. And I've had a couple of experiences that were absolutely lovely because we just slowed everything down. We did the, in one case, we did the bathing, we decorated the room with flowers. We spent an entire day um, telling stories and um, having individual opportunities for people to be together and having the family being there laughing and remembering. Um, and in one case, I had to send the cremation society away three times, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just for some reason couldn't get the message right. But um, it makes such a difference for families, I think. And I do think that's one of the things we can bring to them is yeah. that it's okay to sit there and have a sandwich and talk about your mom. And it's okay to uh, just take the entire day um, mm -hmm. for that transition. It's really lovely. Yeah. And wouldn't your mom want you to have a sandwich? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, it's like, yes. Yeah, eat, you eat, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. 
Yeah, thank you, Patricia. I mean, I, I wanted to ask a question about, I've had some occasions, quite a number more, of very peaceful deaths where people were conscious at the end. And you mm -hmm. said that they become comatose and it didn't seem like there were any alternatives, but that wasn't my experience. So tell, tell us a little bit more. Well, these are people who were not afraid to die and mm -hmm. they had some knowledge about what was happening and they were in a way sort of communicating with us what was going on while they were dying. So they were able to educate us. But they, but they uh, I remember one of, one of my friends who was in her nineties who just before she died, she looked at me and she said, you have to let everything go. Wow. And I've never forgotten that because I thought it's probably the best instruction for dying that you could give. But she was perfectly lucid right at the, yeah. at, at the end. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I think if you don't have pain medication, then that's more likely. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and depending on, on if there's a disease um, in progress as well. Um, that can make a huge difference too. So yeah. I've been told that at a certain stage, pain is not so much an issue because of the deterioration process so that it might be not necessary to do as much medicating. Yeah. I think it may and be the nurses who care more <laughs> for people being comfortable and they're more concerned about that. But actually for the dying person, I'm not sure it's the best thing. Well, and it's really interesting. I've been privy to... Um, conversations that that with private clients and their medical team and um i've had private clients that have been firm about i don't want any pain medication i don't want you know i just i want to mm -hmm. want to be present and um and then other people that have, have said i want everything you've got i want the whole arsenal give me it all and and I, so i think every, you know every if, if people can actually make those choices and, um, and if, if they can do it and have it be um, documented so that everybody is aware of that and everybody knows and even still offer, you know, would you need any pain medication? Um, what a great way to go. Yeah, that would yeah, be absolutely. Yeah, thank it's you. Like childbirth, as you said. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. yeah, yeah. Anyone else? I have a, a procedural question. Um, as I'm a volunteer doula at Shalom, but I'm pretty new and I haven't been present to at the time of death um, with a patient yet. And I'm picturing myself doing 11th hour. I'm there with a patient, maybe with some loved ones, the patient dies. What's my responsibility as far as informing staff? Well, it would be great if you did that, um, just because then the, the family can stay with the patient. And, the, and so, yeah, if you're in the room and the patient dies, I always, you know, just excuse yourself and let staff know. Because what happens then is a nurse, a staff member comes in and calls it. So they call it calling it. And, um, what that is, is they just determine the time of death. And that's what gets put on um, the death certificates. So that's just a procedural aspect to it. So yeah, it, you know, again, it's not an emergency, so people don't have to call 911. But yeah, at some point, after you've maybe given gratitude, um, yeah, go ahead and grab a, a staff member. And you can tell them, too, what time the person died, if, if you know. So yeah. Good question, Jack. Anybody else? You know, I have something to say. <laughs> um, and it goes back to that last thing. And so I'm the um, volunteer coordinator at the hospice program and so proud of uh, this team of doulas and my whole volunteer team. But, um, and what I think about sometimes, I think about that pain question that was uh, just brought up and um, people, there's such a, um, that gets to be a really tricky piece of 
real estate to tread on. And what makes it really tricky is people have um, misinformation on morphine. Even healthcare profession professionals, our person who I love, who does our um, our uh, orientations for our employees was telling everyone that Jewish people don't really like morphine because they don't believe in assisted suicide. And morphine is not assisted suicide. So many people, that was the educator, educating all of our new staff and he's been with us for such a long time, needed to be educated. And so I think if you even start to tread in those kind of waters with people, you get into some really dangerous areas. And um, so I'd really, <clears throat> when, you're, when you're thinking about pain management and death, I would invite you to um, keep that very, like your death and your pain management and not somebody else's because you really, unless you really know what you're talking about and you don't, you don't. This is uh, doctors and nurses play around with those those um, <clears throat> dosages and and what and they're tossing all around. It's never the same. I always think, how can we have still have this conversation? We have lots and lots and lots of people dying all the time. Why are we still? We just go to the chart. There is no chart, so you don't know it. They don't know it. And it's all an art. So I would really invite you to consider that for your own death and what you would like. And even your opinions can, if you say to somebody, and somebody has, we've had uh, nurses aides say to patients, oh, don't, don't get morphine. That just makes you die. And she was like, oh. yeah. it's just really, I would invite you to just steer clear from, from that conversation and ad advise people who want to talk about pain to discuss it with their healthcare professional. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I think we might call it a night, folks. <laughs> Thank you all Thank for you. coming. Thank, Thank you so wow. much, Nina, for your amazing, I'm sorry about the dog, of course, when I undo it, there's the dog, uh, your amazing presentation. It was very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for the Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank night. you. So good. Thank, thank you, Nina. You're welcome. Hi. <laughs> I was going to see if there was an after party. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. <laughs> have you met Agnes? You. Have you met Agnes? I haven't. I, I mean, at the last Dula meeting, I, I saw uh, him briefly, but I didn't. I haven't formally met. Hi. Okay. Hi, Agnes. Fran. Fran, Agnes. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. <laughs> Welcome to the team. Yeah. It's. It's a really amazing team. It's a very, very amazing team. I'm really happy to be back. <laughs> yeah, we're glad to have you back too. So, yeah. oh, in touch here before too, like earlier. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you were I here took before a, I took started. a leave. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I took a little leave. Had to had to go take care of some business. When did you first join the team? Um, a little over a year ago. Okay. Cool. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah, we're glad to have you back. Yeah, I'm really glad to be back. It's good. Ah, a new dawn. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll be in touch with you. We'll get going. I would love that. I'd love to get coffee sometime. Sure. Yeah, Let's that do sounds it. good. Cool. All right, lovely. Nice to meet you. Yeah, and have nice a good night. You. Thank you, Rhonda. Yeah. Thank right. you, Rhonda. <laughs> All right. Good night, you guys. Take care, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
something that would be I would, should have brought. I didn't bring that sketchbook. Too bad. Okay, but, so a net bed. Yeah, and then I'm like, I was, I need to take more measurements.